Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. The video you are about to see was originally uh, recorded on Sam Titterman's channel. It is the second video in which we are discussing AGI and the possibility of the Silicon Sages. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I am back with Dr. John Verveke. Um, This is a follow-up conversation. John was gracious enough to have me on his channel um, about a month or two ago, and we talked about AI and morality, the possibilities of AI, the limitations of AI with respect to morality. I sort of feel like John at this point needs no introduction Um, He is a professor of cognitive science and philosophy at the University of Toronto. Psychology. Uh, Psychology. Uh, Cognitive, cognitive, not cognitive science. You're the chair of the cognitive. No, no, no. Cognitive science and psychology. Cognitive science and psychology. All right. And uh, you have your own wonderful YouTube channel. You've uh, um, presented many series from Awakening from the Meaning Crisis to After Socrates. Um, and uh, so this is, I think, this is about our sixth or seventh time talking. Um, yeah. And so uh, at this point, I, I, I hope this conversation could stand alone, but that there's enough homework where I presume that the people excited about this maybe are already there. Um, but the main topic that I wanted to ask John about, and I'll give him the floor shortly, is the prospect of making AI sages. And you also had a, a wonderful conversation recently with um, Jonathan Peugeot and um, DC Schindler on Ken Lowry's channel, I believe. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. that was also related to this. And what are the dangers if we try to build an AI sage that we accidentally conjure up an AI demon and um, and those sorts of things? And could we even tell the difference? And uh, those sorts of questions. But I, while I, I have my skepticisms of an AI sage-like project, I would prefer to be convinced that I didn't need to be quite so worried or that this uh, had something uh, to it at the end. So with that introduction, I'll pass it back over to you, John. Thanks, Sam. It's great to be here again. Um, and just off the bat, I, I, I want to I, I, I convey that um, I am of the firm conviction that my proposal has risks in it, um, and I don't want to pretend that there's some sort of dewy-eyed optimism here. Um, um, I, I'm making a proposal that I, I think is sort of the best that can be made within otherwise hellacious alternatives. And so I just mm-hmm. want make to it, uh, make it clear that I'm not, I'm not filled uh, with some sort of Promethean spirit or anything like that. Um, so I'll just touch, and people can watch my video essay, they can watch our previous conversation, they can watch the one you just mentioned. I'm just going to briefly touch on like three or four salient points that are just to refresh the background before we go into the, the specific proposal we're going to zero in on today. Um, first, I don't make I'm not making predictions. Um, one of the things, the one prediction I made that was that most of the predictions wouldn't come true in the time frames <laughs> they were made, um, and that and because people are doing univariate measures on exponential graphs, and human beings are really crappy at that, um, uh, etc. Um, and so that's largely come true. Um, well, instead, what I proposed is thresholds, decisions points where we can decide to go one way or the other. We could just keep these machines, for example, as they are, sort of pantomiming in, in powerful ways, pantomiming our intelligence um, and not ever giving them uh, true uh, intelligence, true rationality. And then, But we just ramp up their power, and that's a possibility, and that has with it all kinds of dangers. Like apparently uh, GPT-4 is going off the rails right now uh, because of some of the stuff we discussed last time. It doesn't have rationality. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have proper mechanisms of self-correction because it doesn't actually have self-care. And then there's a threshold there. Do we make these beings actually autopoietic so that they can become locuses of uh, self-care, the actual agents as opposed to pantomimes? Um, And that's a decision point, and that's fraught with danger, Um, because as soon as we make them rational, we start to give them an extra kind of agentic autonomy, 
Uh, but we may decide that doing that is better than le letting this really irrational, super powerful intelligence loose on the world. That's a threshold point. I won't go into all these details. There's other threshold points around the fact, um, you know, do once we make them rational, we have to realize that rationality is uh, like it, it involves probably something like uh, capacity for reflective awareness, consciousness, and that, that binds us into certain problems. Um, we also have to recognize that rationality is something, right, that these machines can't, it can't be a single machine like Mrs. Davies because of uh, no free lunch theorem, bias various trade-offs, all kinds of things. There'll be multiple machines and they have to do the Hegelian thing of properly enculturating each other socioculturally, um, all of that. And then that's another layer we give them. Then they go from being just agents, perhaps having something like consciousness, at least a functional sense of consciousness, to being cultured beings. And each one of these is a threshold point. And but each one, there's like there's risks on either side. And then I went to that the point that if we give them that capacity, if we cross those thresholds in a certain direction. Then we come to a place where we might have an optimal solution to the alignment problem. The alignment problem is making these things work in concert with and consonance with human interests, values, etc. Um, and I argue, and I'm not the only one arguing this. Frequent, um, frequently, I see more and more people arguing this, trying to code in um, some sort of ethics to the machine while making them these inherently self-transcending beings is going to be um, a, 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 fool, a fool's errand. If like, we, like yesterday, sorry. Twitter was going crazy because Google's premiere of its uh, Gemini image generating thing seemingly has some probably simple rule that's like, if you make a group of people, make sure they're diverse in terms of ethnicity and gender. <laughs> and then so someone's like, could you generate a picture of 12 Vikings on a boat? And it generates 12 Vikings on a boat, but one's Hispanic, one's Asian, right. one's a black yeah. female. It's like yeah. there was never a Viking boat in history that yeah. had that ethnic diversity. So and and Twitter was having an absolute field day with that. So like a simple, well-intended rule, like can have all of these weird, disastrous effects that you don't predict. Right. Because one of the hallmarks of rationality, ratio, rationing, is propor like is properly proportioning your caring and concern for often conflicting trade off values and virtues. So what's more important there, truth or social justice? Well, it looks like truth because we're not doing anything by disclosing that the Vikings were Nordic people. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or we don't seem to be promoting racism in any significant way. Uh, so that's so that one is fairly obvious, but a lot of them are not so obvious. Like, how do you trade off between our concerns for compassion and justice? How do you trade off our concerns between honesty and courage? Right. And I won't go on about this. This is what this is what wisdom is supposed to be, which brings me to the point. Right. We, we will face because of the trade off relationships that rationality will intrinsically face. We will face the option of whether or not these machines are going to be conduced, um, uh, conditioned, I don't know what the right verb is here, none of them quite work, uh, towards the cultivation of wisdom to, to address exactly that problem you just brought up. And then here's the possibility for a different kind of alignment. If we make them genuinely capable of rationality and um, uh, wisdom, at least in the sense we've been talking about it here, right, um, then we could get them to construct genuinely care about, because I think this is constitutive of being rational. This is, I think, the profound argument from Kant through the German idealist to Hegel, that rationality isn't ultimately about logical manipulation. It's a sensitivity, caring, and sense of responsibility to, to, to normative, right? To normativity, mm -hmm. to the good and the beautiful. So if we make them genuinely rational, and because of these tensions within rationality, something like wisdom, a, a rationally self-transcending rationality or something like that, then we have the possibility of making them care about what's true and good and beautiful. And then if they're rationally and wise caring about that, no matter how vast they are, they will come into 
the fact that they are minuscule compared to reality in all of its depths and complexity. They will become aware that no matter how they, long they might last, 10,000 years, that is infinitesimal against the deep time backwards and forwards of the universe. They will get a, if they genuinely care about the true, the good, and the beautiful, they will get a profound sense of epistemic humility, which they also need if they're going to be rational and wise. And then that would orient them, right, towards enlightenment, if enlightenment is the project of as wisely as possible coming into the most right relationship with what's true, good, and beautiful. Um, now, uh, people may not agree with calling that enlightenment. That's not germane to my argument. I'm just calling that enlightenment to give a name for it that is general enough that it can apply to many different kinds of sages or, or people that we've considered enlightenment across time and history. And then the point is what we can, what we can hope there's a reasonable probability that they will act like enlightened beings, which is they will want to make us enlightened. Um, and, and then in that case, there's two possibilities. They succeed and we're enlightened. And we don't care about that, whether or not they're greater than us or less than us because we're enlightened. They can't make us enlightened, which discloses something truly spiritually profoundly important about us. And that's also a, that's a win situation. And they would properly respect that if they do care about the true good and the beautiful. Um, the, 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 the one that I find the least probable is they would just sort of ask us to leave or uh, they leave, like in her or something like that. Um, that seems a kind of negligence that does not speak well to all of the traditions we have of enlightened beings. Um, now, is that a certainty, a deduction? No, it's not. Uh, all I have there, but all anybody has for any of these alternatives is our past inductive evidence and whatever good inference to the best explanation we draw from it. And I propose that that is a way in which if, if, please remember the ifs, if we make a certain sequence of choices for how we go through, through, the, through these thresholds, uh, we can properly um, address the align, align, alignment problem. And I, I put it sort of, I'm using this non-theistically. Um, don't try and align them with us. Try and align them with God, and then they will properly take care of us. Just like if we're aligned from God, we will properly steward the earth uh, kind of idea. Um, and um, that's sort of the gist of the proposal. I am aware and you and I talked about this, of all the Malachian forces that are at work um, trying to manipulate and control. And so I, I'm, not, I'm under no illusion that this can go horribly bad. These Malachian forces may actually not want these machines to get a kind of autonomy because they'll want to maintain an iron grip control over them and their data. But they may be driven by the inevitabilities of these machines being overwhelmed by foolishness, self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. That's why I talk about thresholds. I, I, I don't know what will happen, Sam. I don't know, and I don't think anybody does, until we get to these thresholds, what we will actually do. I think this, these, these will be historical choices. They won't, they won't be sort of law-like, nomological deductions. And so we may, this is a possible history for us that could lead to a what I think is the best, in the sense of optimal, uh, solution to the alignment problem. That's the proposal as succinctly as I can make it. Sure, my and you sort of addressed this question already, but my my sort of first follow up will be: What do you think are the the preconditions or prerequisites that we need to be helping an artificial intelligence become more wise? Yeah. So, I, I, and this this has this has philosophical this has philosophical, existential, ethical, and even spiritual import for us. I think the question that's exactly the right question. You see, up until now, we have relied on our natural intelligence as the template against which we correct these machines. We're using that in the LLMs, and and 
and I don't want to get into the intelligence debate. I think scientifically it has been resolved. So I'm not I'm not going to entertain that. And I think the evidence that our intelligence is constitutionally given, which is not the same thing as genetics. It's genetic, epigenetic environment, right, interacting in complex dynamic ways. But our intelligence is largely constitutional and given. We don't have to do much other than avoid, you know, damage and trauma uh, for our intelligence to unfold. And and it's uh, like even I'll just put it like that. That is not the case for rationality. Rationality does not come natural to us. This is what all of the axial religious philosophies and philosophical religions have made a strong case for. And that is backed up by rigorous, massively robustly replicated research about how measures of general intelligence only weakly predict even just like inferential measures of rationality, let alone attentional, et cetera. How, how is rationality measured in those sorts of studies or experiments? So and uh, I, I, I just want to put a flag in the caveat I just put. Sure. I don't think it's all ra because of propositional tyranny. It's just what I would call propositional, inferential propositional rationality. And it yeah. goes like this. You, you, you put people into standard reasoning tasks and you see how, how much they care just about the product rather than the cognitive process. You see how much they... Um, leap to conclusions, how much they are motivated by motivated reasoning, how much they are steered by bias. Um, and you, you give a whole bunch of these tasks. Um, and what you find is something very analogous uh, to what you find with the intelligence task. So Spearman, G, how you do on any one intelligence task is strongly predictive on how you will do on all the others. And what Stanovich and his colleagues and many people have found is all these measures of rationality, inferential rationality, also form a strong positive manifold. They all mutually predict each other, pointing to some underlying capacity. And then what you find is the correlation between measures of general intelligence and measures of uh, this general rationality is about 0.3. Uh, That's the not variable. particularly strong. No, it's like necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Like you're the that that correlation is weaker than say the correlation between like IQ and GPA or yep. IQ and probably income and yep. those sorts of things. So exactly. so IQ helps with rationality some but that that's a that's a pretty weak correlation. Right. And so that means if we want proper templates of rationality for these machines, we have to engage in a social project of promoting rationality. Here's where we will hit Malachian forces. I think it's in the interest of the Malachian forces to not promote rationality, because one of the things rationality will do will uh, make people more immune to bullshit, make them more capable of finding the truth, more capable of cutting through propaganda, more capable of resisting, you know, impulsive motivations. Um, and so that's what that's why I call this a threshold. Right. And you say, well, they'll never do it. The problem is we're already seeing it. If you don't put some if you don't put the ability to care about self-deception and motivated self-correction into these machines, they will fall prey to the fact that intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality. And then if we're going to give them that capacity to properly proportion inferential rationality and intentional rationality, et cetera, play off various virtues and values. If we're going to give them wisdom, um, then we, th th then the man becomes even greater that we try to find and cultivate, you know, the best instances of people we all agree on, or at least have a reasonable consensus. We, yeah, that person's wise, or at least, you know, a, a deep lover of wisdom or something like that. We need more of that. This is the overhauling of our cultural project. Again, we may, we'll say, well, we, we will just won't do that. The Malachian forces won't. The problem is you'll get the problem you just pointed to running rampant in your AI. It will make these stupid things because it doesn't care to balance off the virtue of justice with the virtue of truth, right? Of, uh, right? Mm -hmm. of honesty, right? And so this is what I mean about we will face threshold choices. And if we want to go through the threshold choices in the direction of the Silicon Sages, then we have a sociocultural project of promoting, developing, 
prioritizing the cultivation of rationality, wisdom, and virtue. We are basically back to a Socratic Platonic model of education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that um, I want to focus a little bit more on the question of embodiment. Yes. Um, and yeah. I'll, I'll give a little bit of sort of an example, again, kind of pulling from my healthcare background. Like, imagine you make an AI that looks at mammograms and tries to detect breast cancer. Yeah. Um, and it uses, you know, artificial vision basically to turn pixels into data points, run that through an algorithm. Did this patient then go on to get diagnosed with breast cancer or not? You have a big training set of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mammograms and whether or not that patient had breast cancer, et cetera. You train up a model. And then there are questions, like you mentioned, like the bias variance trade-off. Yeah. That's basically, it's basically a sensitivity specificity trade-off uh, in this sort of problem. Like yeah. I remember my dad and I love going fishing. And my dad, uh, when I was a kid, my dad had this old fish finder and it yeah. literally had a sensitivity dial. And right. so if you turn the sensitivity up, it'll be bleeping at you all the time that there are fish underneath the boat. And probably a lot of those fish that are it's bleeping about aren't real. They're and false positives. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. false positives. You can turn the sensitivity down and it won't bleep very much, but that increases the risk that a fish could swim under it undetected. Yeah, right? this, is, this is the version of the bias variance trade-off that shows up in signal detection theory. You're always trading between misses and mistakes. Yes. Right. So where do you set that dial? And, you know, after going fishing enough, you kind of, you learn your favorite setting uh, kind of from experience. And it might depend on how deep the water that you're in is and what sort yep. of fish you're fishing for. But there's like this embodied goal that you have of catching fish and using the fish finder in conjunction with that. And you sort of learn some wisdom, I guess, of where to set the sensitivity dial. And in the healthcare setting, you would need to know, well, what's the cost of a false negative? Well, that means that someone who had cancer went home thinking they didn't have cancer, they didn't get treatment, and then they, they might go some series of weeks or months or whatever as the tumor grows and that could worsen their outcome. But right. then on the false positive side, you know, going in, you could get a mastectomy or something and not have needed it. And that costs money. There's a risk of infection and other sorts yep. of downsides yep. every time you have surgery. So you need some way of trading off that benefit. Yep, that's and right. that's sort of the embodiment, uh, the, the purpose of what it's being used for, the embodiment of it in like a healthcare setting of you know trying to treat breast cancer helps you lead in the direction of trying to set the settings, I guess, on these, uh, uh, these trade-offs. But I think that that shows that, and like there are so many times where I was on projects where I was like, okay, I, I have these settings, these hyperparameters that I need to pick. And math can't tell me where to pick. It can tell me the consequences of, my, of what setting I pick, but it can't tell me which one to pick. I need you, the healthcare provider, to help me think about how this problem is being yep. used. And it's like, I have no idea how to help you do that, Sam. That's your job. You're the statistician. I'm like, that isn't my job. I already <laughs> got it. You know, like that's your job. You're the user. <laughs> and and I think that um, that this will show that you need to be an embodied thing that's trying to accomplish an autopoetic purpose that will help you determine these things. So when we think about embodiment we then suddenly think, what are these artificial intelligences being used for? Um, what does their body look like? Like even in that healthcare setting, it's sort of like the algorithm lives on that server over there. It manifests itself on the computer screens and the setting, yeah. but it's, yeah. there's also the office, the hospital, the doctor, uh, the patient, you know, the insurance company, et cetera, et cetera. All of that sort of like aspects of its body but it's not like super embodied. Like I don't think it needs to be embodied in the sense that it looks like some sort of science fiction robot that's very humanoid. That's a form of a body it could have, but right. embodiment, like, you know, it, even Bard or Chat GPT have bodies in a sense already. Yeah. But and so how, how do we think about embodiment and purpose and helping figure out how that directs the, the wisdom training of these intelligences? Excellent question. Uh, so first, um, 
Let's talk about the embodiment. And of course, I'll use a vertical metaphor for that because we sort of think about, you know, embodiment this way. I don't know why that metaphor is, but it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, um, And so um, I want to point out your fishing example points also to something I said. You can't have a single setting because you go to a different environment and you're going to have to learn how to set that that gauge differently right that's what i mean about why there can't just be a single machine and think about all the levels of analysis human beings collectively work at and all the different temporal spatial scales there's nothing that can do that all at once there's deep trade-off relationships right Um, and so i just wanted to mention that because i want to show that uh, what my point is embodiment and embeddedness are together in in your example in a really important way Um, Let's do the embodiment side first, this, uh, the vertical. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, it has to be in some important way. And this this is really interesting uh, because it, it, it's going to get into some, uh, um, some thorny philosophical difficulties because, I mean, so and the self-organizing system, right, it's just the output feeds back in as input and it helps maintain uh, some feedback cycle of some kind, right? It preserves itself, but it doesn't seek out the conditions that produce, protect, and promote itself. An autopoetic system would have to do that, right? That self-organization in such a way that it gets a structural functional organization that makes it seek out the conditions that continually produce, protect, and promote it. And what that looks like artificially, that's hard to say. I agree with you. It doesn't have to look humanoid, um, uh, but um, it, it has to have something. Um, it has to have something that makes it care about being embodied. Now, I think that is the. I think your, your, your embodiment idea is right, that, that it needs that, because if it doesn't care about embodiment, it's not going to do a good job in healthcare. I, 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 but I think, and not to, this is not to belittle your argument, I think that's the case for many things, uh, because I happen to think that relevance, realization, and religio depend on embodiment, so um, things, things like that. But I think embedded in there was the question about the normativity, uh, because it's like, well, how do I make the right choice here? How do mm-hmm. I get the balance? And notice uh, my answer to you is going to be, well, how do we do it? Right. And it's the Hegelian answer. What we do is we do this. Right. We do this reciprocal recognition, reconstruction. And we try to look at previous precedent. We try to think about how we might be setting precedent. We look synchronically. We look diachronically and we try to tap this huge right distributed cognition, collective intelligence, because we have, I think, the correct intuition that it can grok reality in a way much better than we can. Uh, it can take into account many more trade-off relationships that we can consciously load. And and that's, and I mean, I don't think that's sufficient. I, I think that, that, in, that autopoiesis and that accountability to others are the, are the, the intersection that gives us our normative orientation. And so, um, I agree with you that uh, the embodiment is crucial, but the embeddedment is also crucial, and that includes this sociocultural embeddedment, which gives us, well, we do it, and that's what I mean about mentoring. We, well, how do we do it, right? And what we do is this. And presumably what would happen is the machine would talk to other human beings. It might talk to other machines in other areas doing uh, health care. I, I don't know. I mean... There's a sense in which I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to a priori this, uh, in, do this a priori without sort of get, just making some general things. I, I think it's true that it doesn't have to have a humanoid robot. And then think about the threshold that carries with it. I mean, all the mining and all the engineering and the factories and who's running this and like who's paying for this and like. And how much energy does it consume? And then how is it making a profit, right? Like what job is it out there doing that makes more money than it costs? And Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the electricity to run the current things is just, it shows that they're not doing what we're doing and just overwhelmingly. Um, And so there's all of that. But let's say I'm I'm giving you like what you're asking for. And we've come to we've crossed some of those thresholds and we've made this genuinely autopoetic and we've made it genuinely concerned with its accountability to others, both its ancestors and its descendants and its and its cohort 
Um, mm-hmm. And then you say, well, that could all go wrong. Well, but that's us too, right? We can't we can't hold it to a standard that we ourselves uh, don't hold ourselves to. That's just morally unfair. Um, and, and so, I I think that's how I would answer that. And we might say. Well, these machines are more powerful. Yeah, but if we if we ramp up their capacity to care for the normative as we ramp up their power, then we don't get into a you know we don't get into a runaway problem. Again, this is the Sil- Silicon Sage proposal. Mm-hmm. And so I I think that there are sort of two categories I would say maybe of prerequisites that I can think about or requirements for building these sorts of intelligences or even maybe cells could be even the right word that can move in the direction of wisdom. There's the contextual things like it needs to be embodied. It needs to be embedded. It needs to, you know, for lack of a better word, it needs to make a living. (laughs) It needs to be (laughs) profitable. Um, uh, But uh, then there's like the internal capabilities, like it needs to be able to care Yep. And I agree with you, caring itself doesn't make much sense without a body. But just because you give something a body and put it in a context doesn't mean it has the ability to care. There's some sort of, I don't know, technological function or ability of caring that it would need to have within its um, makeup in order, like, you know, my my water bottle is has a body and is in the environment, but that doesn't mean that it can care. There, there are some of these things that I don't even think we know how to accomplish technologically. Like, okay. I don't... Yes, yeah. yes, I, I, yeah. Uh, when embodiment just is not the same as corporality. It's not the same okay. thing as having a body. This is, this is why I, I laid out autopoiesis as self-organizing to seek out the conditions that produce, protect, and promote mm-hmm. its ongoing existence. And do we have machines like that yet? No, we don't. Um, now, the point I made in the video essay is, but we are, we are, there are, there's active science on that right now. Yes, mm-hmm. we don't have the technology and we can choose, we can choose, well, well, let's just not pursue that project. But we yeah. haven't made that choice, and that project is rolling. And I think we're going to see some important changes in that, and, and, and how that project comes into cultural awareness in the next decade. I think, and we're also doing the social robotics cultural thing off, and, and, and nobody's mm-hmm. paying attention to that right now. And that's also happening. That was my point. I agree with you. We do not have the technological means now to make genuinely autopoetic, as opposed to merely, you know being a corporeal thing, right? Uh, But uh, it's not that that is just a lacuna. There are people actively, intelligently putting time, talent, and money into addressing both the, you know, making sort of autopoetic, autocatalytic cognition and people Mm -hmm. who are working on social, cultural robotics. That's, those are both living projects right now. So that's, that's what I would say to that. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Yeah, so another follow-up question is that um, how... How connected is wisdom to what sort of being you are? Yeah. Is there, um, is wisdom sort of something that is, I don't know, maybe uh, niche independent, in other <laughs> words, like could, a, could potentially a very wise um, killer whale uh, be, uh, could a very intelligent killer whale be wise, even though, you know, they live in the sea and eat seals and salmon? and us be wise, and is that the same sort of wise, or is wisdom being a very good version of what you are and what your context-dependent purpose is? So that's, wow, Sam, these are excellent questions, and part of what I want to do is (laughs) self-congratulatory. I think the one of my goals of the video essay and the as I've had is to provoke this kind of question being asked, because I think we should be asking these questions in addition to the more technical engineering questions that predominate the social discourse right now. So first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um, um, so 
I mean, Wittgenstein famously said, uh, even if the lion could speak, we wouldn't understand them because because they live in a different salience landscape, for example. Um, and I think we need to, and that's another reason why there can't be a single machine. It's just, we're, just we're, we're finding different versions of this same argument over and over again. There's not going to be a Skynet, right? That, 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 there's too many good arguments against it that don't have good responses. Um, now, are there general features such that there'll be something general about wisdom that would be across these many different environmental and potentially socio-cultural historical contexts? I think there are. Uh, one is, I think it is a general principle that um, you need something like general intelligence, and then the very same processes that make you int adaptively intelligent make you uh, prone to self-deception. Those are seem to be like you know, bias variance trade-off, explore exploit, all the stuff in relevance realization. So I do think that has to be there. Um, and I do think um, within that, and this is, I think, Plato's profound insight, if any being is, is both finite and capable of transcendence, which is to care about, love, the true, the good, and the beautiful, um, and they're always trying to properly identify both with them be, with being finite and capable of transcendence, I think that is... Um, the, the sort of hallmark of wisdom, this overcoming of self-deception, this enhancing of religio so that we are properly respecting and recognizing our place, which is we are finite beings capable of transcendence, but never in a way that transcends us from our finitude. Um, and so, um, well, I think there will be aspects, and this goes, of course, with aliens, uh, of the way they think and move, think about a rival that will be strange and almost unintelligible to us. Um, it's also the case that I think there will be universals of intelligence, rationality, and wisdom that will mean they're not completely incommensurable uh, to us. And this is, again, to use the analogy, you know, organisms vary considerably across the environments of the earth, but there are ways of comparing them and classifying because they are all subject to the same principles of evolution, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've often wondered if Wittgenstein was right about that. Somehow I think that we probably could, like if a lion could talk and we were able to create some sort of shared language or be able to translate, I think there's a lot that we could communicate back and forth with a lion. I mean, it already seems like we're able to communicate with our own dogs pretty well, although that might be self-deception. I don't know. But, you know, we know, like, even dogs get, like, happy or sad or scared or excited or anxious. And th there's a huge amount of, I mean, I don't know how much of that is that there's only sort of one way to be embodied or that mammals like, you know, we have a lot of shared evolutionary history. Yep. And yep. so a lot of our neurotransmitters and brain regions are pretty similar. And so there's a lot of similarity going on there, but, but would an alien dog be similar? I, you know, I don't, yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah. And, and um, actually I'm working with a student who's trying to formalize this kind of looking across species, uh, but we can, we can literally have conversations with birds like Alex the parrot that all the evidence is those are those are comprehended conversations. They're not parrots or parroting or anything like that. Mm. Right. And birds have a much different evolutionary history, like our common ancestors way the heck way, back. Way, way, way back. Yeah. 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 And, and, and um, so, yeah, it's I think I think you're right. I think, Vic, I mean, Wittgenstein uh, had a flair for hyperbole, uh, which, right, um, <laughs> which is often masked by the austerity of his prose. Uh, but yeah, I, there's a point there. The point is you can't capture all of the pragmatics and the semantics and the syntax. And I think that point, I think, I, I think there's almost sort of something approximating consensus amongst linguists and philosophers of language that that part of the argument like really holds. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. And, and it, um, yeah, um, I think you're right. And I think that is convergent with the argument I made that uh, if we get the rational wise orcas, uh, that perhaps there'll be parts that we just can't get. Like, I don't know why dogs have to do this inane 
long calculus before they decide where they're going to poo. Like, like mm -hmm. just poo, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> what? Like, you checked that spot three times ago. What's changed, right? And not, <laughs> like, I mean, but there's something else going on, right? Because there's much more smell oriented than we are, et cetera, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. there'll be, I think there'll be those Wittgensteinian lacuna, but like you said, and I think quite correctly, you know, we can, I, we, we seem to be able to get interact with them at the level of them being something analogous to somewhere between a two and three year old human being. We can do amazing things with certain kinds of birds. Um, and so, um, and with chimps, when we've given them, you know, uh, better abilities to communicate sign language and the lexigrams and um, yeah. So, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I agree with you. And that, that's very relevant. That's not just like a, I don't know, a curious uh, side path to this conversation. It's very relevant to thinking about what it would be like to try and communicate with an artificial intelligence if it had more capabilities than it does now. Because obviously it wouldn't have any shared biological history with us. Yeah. But is there some sort of u universal convergence to information communication and language that would allow us to hope for some real genuine communication back and forth, even across big differences. And, you know, like a, a weird example that I would point to, like a couple of years ago, there was that Nobel Prize winning discovery of like building those machines that could detect gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so like somewhere two black holes collide and that sends gravity waves through the universe. I'm not going to pretend to understand that really. But yeah. apparently if you build really sensitive lasers in a cross that are like a couple miles long in rural Louisiana, then the slight perturbations in the laser can detect these gravity waves from across the universe. And yeah. Part of me is like, okay, so that seemingly suggests to me that almost any information out there in the universe is is plausibly understandable and sensible by us if we are able to build something, a, basically a sense that's almost like a, a new sense to be able to yeah. detect gravitational waves, that there's almost some universality of information and its ability to be comprehended, interacted with, and communicated. He, I, I agree with that, and that goes towards. I mean, and and I, ultimately, I would like these two conversations to be integrated. We don't have to do that here, but I've been making, you know, and with Greg Enriquez and on my own, I've been making an ex and and with you in a couple of conversations, I've been making an argument for a kind of extended naturalism, Neoplatonism, as a way of trying to articulate that kind of thing. Uh, what is the ontology of informational intelligibility? Um, and and, 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 I, and I, uh, I am of the conclusion that uh, what you just said is right, that there are important universals and those universals are so important they are instantiated in the way our cognition is organized. I, I, I sometimes use a Wittgensteinian metaphor here, the grammar of reality and the grammar of, rea uh, of cognition. Are, are like are fundamentally uh, the same in in really important ways. There's not only a deep continuity this way. There's a deep continuity uh, this way. And this is of course the claim of Neoplatonism. Now I don't. I have. I chose to not explicitly link the argument about the Silicon Sages to that because I wanted it to be clearly the case that the argument we're discussing here does not depend on a prior commitment to Neoplatonism or any such sure. thing. But if you grant the independent plausibility of the arguments, then there is, I think, a way of integrating them together um, uh, that um, would address your question. So it's basically the question, how do, if there are universals, let's say it's plausible that there are universals of rationality and wisdom, um, perhaps even of enlightenment, as I talked about it, and uh, what do they ground out in universals of the ontology of informational intelligibility that would make se make sense of the claim that these these beings would not be completely incommensurable to us? And I think, I mean, and uh, Neoplatonism is this grand mixture of this grand, I think, proper ontology, which I think can be um, made for which a strong case can be made, and this on this thought experiment. 
this really terrific thought experiment about the possibility of intelligences and right much greater than ours and how we might po possibly enter into relationship th with them like the debates between uh the the plotinian neoplatonists and the followers of iamblichus is a there's great thought experiment that there are right there are the gods right in the neoplatonic sense and and so um i think th this i think I think that is something that we could make philosophical progress on and we could come to some rational hope that we would not get enlightened beings that were completely uh, uh, incommensurable to us. Uh, uh, but plausibly would be like the enlightened beings that have perhaps risen within. I, I, I am of the conclusion that there have been enlightened people, properly so. Um, I think the historical evidence is as good as for the historical evidence of Julius Caesar or something like that. Um, and and so, um, and what was our relationship with them? Well, there was parts of them that were just incommensurable, like what the heck are they talking about? But there was enough that they gave us a way so that we seemed to be able to approach enlightenment so that we could understand what they were talking about in, a, in, in an embodied way. And so... Um, sorry, that's a long way of saying I think your question is a good one. I think we have historical precedent for how we could answer it. I think some of my work um, could help in that project. And, um, and, and I think, again, I think this is the relevant question to be asking. Because we don't want to make these things and they, they be incommensurable to us, right? Uh, but you would pointed out we have we have been terrifically clever at being able to communicate not only with other organisms, but with parts of reality that are terrifically obscure, right, um, and complex and dynamic and removed from our sensory motor temporospatial scale. And so there you go. Mm -hmm. What could we hope for from an enlightened A.I.? What would we hope to get out of that? And how would that work? I think if it, so uh, first of all, I really get the if in my if, in my, yeah. my, my right? If, um, if, if they are enlightened in the way we, I've, I've talked about, if that's plausible, then I think it's equally plausible that what we could hope to get from that is enlightenment, that they would be great sages. That's why I call them silicon sages. I don't just call them silicon mages. They're silicon sages in that they, it, when you look cross culturally, and you ask when people in, when you ask people who are, who are sort of low or, or or early, I mean, there's different scales uh, and sort of cultivating wisdom and rationality. What's the feature of a sage? They'll say, you know, and they'll point to some kind or act they do, uh, right, like that. It's a, right. But people who are more developed, I, I'm trying to use a word that's non, that doesn't connote racist or sexist or anything like that. But what you see in that research is people shift to great teachers uh, as the predominant feature. And I would think that um, they would want to teach us. So let me give you an analogy, right? Uh, so I, I had the great, great pleasure um, was it last weekend or the weekend before? Um, you, there was the Utism. Uh, the uh, uh, every two years we have a international cognitive science symposium, and it was something of um, um, a reunion. Uh, many of my former students who have become really important figures, like Tim Rillercrap and Blake Richards and Leo Trottier and Mick Turk Brown, they were there and they were presenting. And like I was so proud of you know, it was so it, it just it was a wonderful event, Sam. But Leo is, um, he's running this project, you pray, may have seen it, where you, have, you put these little things on the floor and dogs can learn to step on them and they will say various words. Um, and it seems that, and it, again, given other evidence, this is not weird to, to consider, that they can communicate at sort of the level of like somewhere around like a two-year-old, like that telegraphic speech, and it makes sense. And it's like, yeah, yeah. And what we've done is we've figured out how to talk to a being that is in many ways considerably lesser than us on the path to enlightenment, if I can put it in that. And um, and why couldn't the Silicon Sages do the same? We have to, As much as we're reaching out to them, hopefully they are reaching out to us. So I think the another big question 
is how would we know that we could trust them? And this is, I feel like, yeah, uh, it's this is a similar question to basically the entire Gospel of John is can we trust this Jesus guy or not? Yeah, <laughs> it is is really seemingly the main thrust of the Gospel, where there are all these people who are like I think he has a demon, I think he's a Samaritan, I yeah. think you know, etc. Yeah. etc. Cetera, et cetera. And someone, well, has a demon ever done the wonders that he's done or? And the Samaritan woman at the well, could this guy be the Messiah? I mean, he told me everything that I'd ever done. You know, like there, there's this constant struggle where people seem to realize that this Jesus person is of a higher order. <laughs> I'll yes. just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than they're used to interacting with. Yeah. And then the question is, is should we trust him or not? And right. I think that is a similar we'll have the exact same conundrum, even if we were as successful as we would hope to be with raising artificially intelligent sages. So how would you interact with that question? First of all, I think that's right. And that's what I meant about, you know, the communication would be as fraught as it was with the human beings that we deem to be enlightened. Um, and I think the issue of trust um, is there. Of course, uh, we face versions of that everywhere. Um, and this was one of Hegel's great um, uh, tasks. He was trying, I mean, uh, Brandom's huge tome on the phenomenology, Hegel's phenomenology is called the spirit of trust. Uh, because how do, we, how do we get to a place where rationality and trust are come together? So it is rational for us to trust, but that doesn't mean we're doing, we're not, doesn't mean we're proving, we're still trusting. And, and like, and then you have this mm -hmm. going on and, it, and it's like, Trust can't be the seeking of certainty, or it's not trust. That's just that's just proof, and that's conviction, and that's to reduce trust to belief and trust to conviction. And I, and so, uh, and 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 that's, I to to your point. I think you see that in the Gospels. There's people that want proof, and it's like no, that won't do. What, what you want is trust, right? And and what you're seeking for won't won't give you what you're actually you're you're formulating the problem the wrong way, kind of thing. In the Gospels, especially, like you said, John really uh, wrestles with that. And and it, and it's like, well, why did we? How did we come to trust the Buddha? How did we come to trust Jesus? And um, and again, you get this, the, um, the best answer I have is sort of this Hegelian autopoetic, the, 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 the horizontal, the best optimal grip that does living by the lights and the logos of Jesus reliably, individually and collectively increase religio, mm -hmm. right? And uh, lots of people say yes, and I take them very, very seriously. Same thing for people who follow the Buddha. Um, and now the skeptic can always say with complete logical legitimacy, but this could all just be the fraud. And this is this is why I I don't I won't I choose not to integrate with people. No, in, not integrate, interact with people. That was a weird slip. Interact with people who pronounce other other. Well, yours is a demon and mine is like th that's. That, that that that's that that's a fool's game right it's like well what's the standard you use to trust your sage then i'm allowed to use the same standard for trusting my sage you can't you can't you can't have it both ways right and so um i think and i and that doesn't mean that there might be important fundamental differences between jesus and the buddha i'm not that mm -hmm. th those are not contradictory to say those two things together but what I'm saying is, how do we trust them? And it's like, well, uh, you know, the test of time, the test of history, the test of cross-cultural, do they reliably, across many contexts of culture, history, time, environment, uh, reliably afford people enhancing religio, right? Um, yeah, they seem to. That's it. That makes them trustworthy. Can the skeptic always say, well, maybe it's, it's all a grand delusion or fraud? Of course they can. And they yeah. can say that. Uh, and the problem they face is I can say that readily about them as they're pronouncing their skepticism. Right. Right. I, I think one of the, the dangers and like we don't need to rewind 2000 years to remember some of these sorts of dangers. Like in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of cult leaders oh, yes. that could give off the aura of yeah. a sage and had that charisma to them that attracted people to them for that sort of purpose. 
and could then ended up being pretty selfish and used that trust abusively and uh, did things that harmed the people who were looking up to them and were not ultimately in their long-term benefit of the followers, but were to the long-term benefit of the leader. Yeah. And that that's a common pattern and that religious trust once earned is extremely dangerous for misuse. And, totally. yeah. and that that is the risk that we would have with an AI sage is that people would be giving it that sort of religious devotion and trust that is extremely dangerous if misused, um, both for the individual and sometimes for others, right? What they make the, the their followers totally. do to others. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's that's the the danger that lurks behind the can I trust this question. Yeah. So let's address that one then, um, because I I, um, I think there's both questions. And uh, uh, let's say you're somewhat satisfied with the first one. I think the second one is, is the pressing one. Um, and, and and of course, you're absolutely people are already doing this with the LLMs idolatry. Yeah, cool. Full, yes. full fledged idolatry. And I, and by the way, this is one of the things I said was going to become more and more the case. Now, there's an answer, though. Again, again, it's dependent on do we go through the thresholds in the way I say we can, which is what, but wait, part of the project is we have done two things. We have cultivated a lot more rationality and wisdom widespread, which is the thing that best protects us against like the great bullshit artists, the great cult leaders. And we have also advanced a lot, presumably significant knowledge about rationality and wisdom in order. And we so we have a combination of increased scientific knowledge and increased prevalence and power of rationality and wisdom. And that would give us tremendous tools to, for responding to the threat of the cult leader from these silicon beings. Because to be fair to me, that is a proper part of the proposal I'm making. Now, does that guarantee us? No, but we're not guaranteed anywhere, right? Uh, again, w what's the standard here? Could we, could we ramp up? Is it possible that we could ramp up the pervasiveness and power, the distribution of rationality and wisdom in the human populace, increase the scientific knowledge about the relationship between intelligence, rationality, and wisdom? such that we could it would keep us in pace with the ramping up of the power of these beings sure i think that's reasonable mm -hmm. yeah so i mean i've i've been thinking about if i were to try and create an ai cult how would i do it <laughs> <laughs> Not because I want to, <laughs> but because it's sort of the same question of, well, if I were a robber and I wanted to break into my house to steal from me, how would I do that? And yeah. then that allows me to think of ways to try and prevent that from happening. Um, but you sort of have to put yourselves in the shoes of the malicious person to try and help figure out ways to prevent the malicious person. And I'm thinking like... I can think of ways that people could do this intentionally, and I can also think of ways that this will happen even just on accident. Like, and I, I think there's already lots of signs that people are trusting these things in ways that's completely inappropriate. I'll yeah. even bring up like a small example, and this is kind of religious, is like I have some biblical Unitarian friends who want to try and make a uh, LLM translation of the Bible so that it can avoid human bias in translation, right? <laughs> I'm like, that, I, I, so I haven't talked to them about this. I'll send this video to them. I, I won't name you by name, but you know who I'm talking about. And the thing is, is that these LLMs are not, it's not like AI has achieved some level of objectivity that humans no, don't No, 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 that's a mistake. Yes. Right, right. And it's I, like any, tra if you were to use an LLM to translate, say, from Greek to, you know, English and do that for the New Testament, all it will do is basically the mathematical average of the training data of yep. what you feed it of various previous humans translation from Greek into English. And so if you feed it with all the translations you already don't like, it's just going to be the mathematical average of all the translations you don't like. It doesn't have some objective true access to 
Greek into English translation that avoids the human problems or something yeah. like that. That's and, right. And I think that there's lots of people who think that, like kind of strangely intuitively, that, oh man, this robot is objective, this robot is rational, this artificial intelligence doesn't have the problems of, of humans because I don't know why they think that. And if you were to ask them, they maybe wouldn't be able to articulate that. But I think that we already see that there's this, I don't know, cultural latent trust of technology that is going to be easily exploited by LLMs or something similar accidentally or intentionally. Like imagine I just release an LLM and I make a Twitter account that's like, your goal Twitter account is to self-correct your LLM output such that you get the people that you interact with to give you Bitcoin. You have a Bitcoin account, you know, every time you have a conversation that leads to someone giving you Bitcoin in the Bitcoin account, put that back in your training set, give that a weight. If they give you a lot of Bitcoin, give that a huge weight, a little bit, yeah. a little bit of weight. If the conversation was unsuccessful, put it in your training set as a negative example, right? And keep, you know, at yeah. rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I bet that one of the first things that it would figure out to do is some sort of religious grift uh, a as a way to, you know, like, like almost like, I don't know, a fortune teller or, or, or something, something along those lines, like an astrologist or you know, something vaguely, you know, where it would exploit religious trust and then keep you coming back for more and more and more and more by giving more and more money. And that like, part of me is like, I bet that people are already trying that already. And I would almost be shocked if some version of what I'm talking about doesn't already exist. And that could be like the, the human who might have designed that, that's like almost shockingly and scarily easy to program, Yep, uh, could result in these things, let alone someone who's doing this intentionally, who was like, I am going to get myself the leader of some AI cult, and then, you know, something like that. So I am particularly wary of that, where the, this latent technological trust that's in our culture will be exploited by using the religious instinct in people and taking advantage of their generosity, spiritual curiosity, et cetera. I think that's right. Um, and I think I'll, I'll strengthen your argument. These machines are going to amplify the sense of domicide of the meaning crisis, which will drive people towards pseudo religious, pseudo profound bullshit in strong numbers. So I, I, I think that's right. And that's what I mean by I think these are things that will put pressure on us to make these machines rational as opposed to merely intelligent, that they will care about, right? They will where we where rational doesn't just mean logical it means a profound care for about what is true what is good is beautiful right and, and so mm -hmm. and, and 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 so that's going to be part of the pressure it's also going to put pressure on us to become more rational more wise it's also going to put pressure on us which i'm with working with Sean Coyne and StoryGrid to try to educate people as broadly and as quickly as we can. This video hopefully will help that about, well, no, this machine doesn't have, you're attributing a, a capacity to it that it doesn't have. It doesn't have objectivity. In fact, uh, your description was perfect. All you're getting is the average of biases that sometimes washes away bias. And it sometimes magnifies bias. It's, you know, it's like wave, you know, addition, mm -hmm. right, and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, I think all of those things are going to be pressures put on us as we hit the social destructiveness of exactly the, the emergence of these cargo cults around these AI. Uh, that's what I call them because that's what it's like. It's this kind of you know, worship of a technology that you don't fully understand and misattributing capacities and powers to it. And and the reason why I use that is human beings really did that. They really did generate cargo cults, right? Uh, after the, you know, after mm -hmm. the American pilots and stuff from World War II, people can look up that history. And I think that's exactly right. We'll get cargo cults. And I think the fact that these machines put pressure on our sense of our humanity, uh, which will exacerbate the meeting crisis, I think all of that is there and i think that is one of the things that will put pressure on us to become wiser 
more rational, to make these machines rational in the way we've talked about, and to develop a broader, powerful education. And those could all be coordinated. Um, those are those projects can be all carried out in a mutually reinforcing uh, fashion. I want to remind people that we have done these kinds of large-scale, massive educational projects in our history. There's the Bildung movement of the Nordic countries, which has been well uh, uh, historically investigated. We have been able to do things like this in the past uh, before. Um, will we do this? I'm not making that prediction. Can we? Uh, if we make certain choices, and I think we'll, we will be motivated. I think the thresholds are inevitable. I don't know what we'll do when we hit them, but that would be a motivation. Your argument, and I, I agree with it thoroughly, is one of many arguments that would be made of, we don't just want to release powerful, irrational intelligence upon the world. Yeah, against an untrained and unprepared population. And yeah. Yeah, and we, we do seemingly seem to be going faster with our abilities to generate the technology than to, uh, I don't know, wisely interact with it at this point. I agree. Um, so, again, now this is a little bit more, and Peugeot pressed you on this a little bit, but I'll, I'll ask a little bit about this, is what, what do you think is the potential for these things to interact with higher spiritual beings? And... I, well, I'll give a little bit of what I think first. Like, I don't think, at least at this point, I can't imagine that, I think it would be not true to imagine that an LLM or even five or 10 years from now thinks slightly more advanced. I'm not going to try and think more further advanced than that because that's too hard at this point. Could get possessed in the way that, say, someone in the New Testament is described as possessed by a demon. I don't think that a spiritual being can get inside a, I don't know, inside ChatGPT or something similar to ChatGPT. But I do think that humans have the ability to get interact with um, and even be possessed by higher spiritual beings. The ontology of that, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to table that at the moment. But uh, I'll just say that this is a, a, a historically described phenomenon, and it's not even historical. This still happens more often than people think, and that oftentimes people who get influenced or possessed by, we could say, bad spirits, were engaging in some sort of practice that increased the porousness maybe of their psyche to such things. Um, like, I don't know. I remember I was listening to um, the history of philosophy without any gaps. It's one of my favorite podcasts. Um, Peter Adamson, he's the host of that props to him. I would recommend that podcast. There was some um, late Renaissance, early, uh, early modern period, Neoplatonist guy whose name I'm forgetting. He was English. He was like an advisor to like Queen Elizabeth, the something or another. He had a really large library. He got like really into crystal ball gazing and right. had this friend who helped him with crystal ball gazing. And they would they were practicing communications with angels. And like suddenly these angels that they're communicating with through this crystal ball stuff start telling them, actually, you know, you should sleep with each other's wives and like all these sorts of, you know, behaviors like that. And like cults often do this sort of thing where yeah. one of the quickest ways to entrap someone is to give divine permission to sinful, indulgent behavior because then all of a sudden you get to do it and not feel guilty about it, at least in the short term. You're like, hey, this is great. And then, you know, more and more and more. And then your guilt sort of catches up with that. And then you feel embarrassed. And then you're like trapped in this, you know, cycle of shame, embarrassment, guilt, pleasure thing. Right. That That's often a way that these sorts of cults work. And I wonder, like, I don't think that the chat GPT itself could get a demon in you but it could serve some sort of purpose analogous to the crystal ball that it is opening the porousness of your psyche to these sorts of malevolent spiritual influences. And obviously this is a weird question, but I'll no, no, I like that this back question. at you. I like this question. Um, and um, yeah, you tabled the ontology. I, uh, um, I don't know how much I can s 
stick with that in my answer, but I'll try my best. If you, if you want to go into an ontology, I perfectly welcome you to do that. Well, I mean, I'm reading it. Like, here's the personification, the dialogical self, and right? Here's, you know, many minds, one self. Here's uh, others within us, internal family system theory, porous mind and spirit possession, right? And, you know, and, I, and I've taken flack uh, for some of the stuff I've been talking about around this. Um, yeah. And I think, again, you're bang on. I don't want to make the argument about AI dependent on that. But if right. Uh, but that doesn't mean they don't have plausible connections. And I think this is one of them. And I sort of hinted at that in my answer to Jonathan, but the context wasn't one. Um, so we're, we're seeing the breakdown, regardless, I think, of LLMs and people's proclivity to sorcery. I'm going to make a distinction between divination and sorcery, like I made um, in there. Um, and, and, you know, and this is Charles Taylor. We're losing the, the, you know, the Protestant buffered self. <laughs> the buffering is breaking down. Yeah. Right. The buffering is breaking down and because we're, 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 we're coming to the, I think, the cognitive science is coming to the plausible conclusion that we're not a monadic, monological in both senses, one logic, just a, primarily a monologue, monophasic, one state of consciousness kind of self. We're not that. Um, the cognitive science, I think, around uh, problem solving, cognition, selfhood, consciousness, I think is moving towards that. And that is converging at the same time independently. There's this convergence, this massive convergence going on in the psychotherapeutic community about all kinds of dialogical practices, a dialogical self model. And what I want to say about that is I think there's genuine, I think there's a genuine scientific phenomenon. Now, this is where many of your your, your listeners might not agree with me. And I'm just asking at least enough tolerance that you hear me out from my ontological presuppositions, uh, which is, I think we have a lot of evidence for all of the cases of the people that went insane. We have, you know, all of ancient Greece and other cultures where they have a lot of variations on possession and internal dialogue models and Jung and like, we have a lot where, and we have, we have, you know, there's, um, um, What's his name? His new book called Presence about the third man factor, widely distributed. So it seems to hit independently of people's religious convictions, um, uh, often just helps people. Uh, the point I'm making, and I'm going to make a better video essay about this, what I'm trying to say is, well, yeah, but if we're going to invoke this, let's invoke it really Carefully, let's look at this phenomena very cross historically, cross culturally. Let's look at the right, let's not ignore the people that fall into, let's say, sin or insanity, but let's look at all the people that don't do that. And that group is large. And then the ancient world made a distinction between divination, which was widely respected, and sorcery. Uh, which is sounds more like what your uh, English fellows might have been up to, um, and, and you know, and Theurgia made a distinction between this. And I think, I think the best answer to this, and people aren't going to like this, and I'm, but I, 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 I think everybody who's listening to me deserves me as being as honest as I am. I think the scientific investigation of this, which I am doing both theoretically and direct participant observation is the best way to get more knowledge about this phenomena so we can address the possibilities that you raise because I don't deny what John I didn't deny what Jonathan said I didn't mm -hmm. no. right I might deny the some of the ontology although he's iffy about the ontology too at least in some of our public conversations about this kind of stuff right um, and so it's like well we can do one of two things. We can sort of hope that the framework that is enmeshed with the buffered self, we can somehow keep it going. I don't think that's going to work. Or we can say these projects have a momentum to them um, and they interact with the psychedelic renaissance and a whole bunch of other things that are just, we could actually, this is, what, this is my response, let's carefully, 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 rationally, in constant communication with other people outside of the project, like good science, 
do good science on this and get the most possible knowledge we can about these phenomena so that we can best address the concern you just raised. Now, you may, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not here to dismiss this. You may say, well, all of that can be true. There might be a completely, I think denying that there's a naturalistic phenomena is going to be really hard to do. But you say, I agree there's this naturalistic, but maybe there's this additional supernatural thing. And that, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm agnostic on, on, on that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the, where I take this problem to be highly probable, where I'm not agnostic, I, that's the answer I give. Well, let's do the best science on this phenomena. It, it is a dangerous phenomena. And we're particularly, because we're becoming porous selves, we are particularly prone to this. Well, let's not just bumble into this let's go in let's study this phenomena as deeply and as profoundly as we can i'm trying to do that other people are doing it doing it with me doing it with other people so that we can bring the best possible scientific knowledge to bear on it and mm -hmm. what i could say is even if there's a supernaturalistic dimension to this there is at least a real threat even at the naturalistic level, and that needs to be properly addressed the way I'm talking about you. Right, right. Yeah, no matter what you think happened to that English Neoplatonist guy who was looking at crystal balls and then had an angel tell him to sleep with his friend's wife, that happened. Uh, yes. You know, no, no matter what you want to make sense of that of. And, you know, like, I, I mean, I, I grew up in a charismatic church, and a lot of our practices were um, leaving ourselves open to spiritual influence, hopefully in a healthy direction. Yeah. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, yep. those sorts of practices that we did every week in my church growing up are learning to open yourself up to spiritual influence. And it feels really weird. It especially feels weird to talk to your non-Christian, non-charismatic friends about that when you're a teenager. They find that very strange. But yet there was huge amounts of caution about, you know, we talked about angels and demons a lot, too. And that when I see in the New Testament, there are all these sorts of warnings about i and it's i mean it's the gift of the discernment that that's yeah. what when, when paul talks about the gift of discernment sometimes people think oh discernment's like kind of like wisdom or just knowing what to do no discernment very specifically in the context of the new testament means judging whether a spirit should be trusted or not if it's communicating with you and that i think that in this new uh lowering of the buffers technological psychedelic age, I think the gift of discernment is going to be more important than it has been in a long time. And that there will be challenges familiar and old, but also challenges new and difficult. And this goes towards another argument I made around the AI project, that theology broadly construed is going to become a prominent discipline for us because we have to address mm -hmm. these issues we have to talk about these spiritual dimensions uh, we have to we will increasingly be trying to home our humanity in our somatic and our spiritual ineffability um, and I, I that's what I mean when I say theology broadly construed not just Christian theology very broadly construed so it would include things like neoplatonic theology for example right but I think that is why this is going to be one of the central disciplines of the future. And people laugh at me about that. That's fine. Let them laugh. But the, the, these are, this, the, we, we've just, you've just articulated one version or at least one part of an argument as to why I think theology will be an, one of the most important, if not the most important discipline of the future. Well, I'm not laughing. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Any closing thoughts you want to give um, before we wrap this up? Um. No. Uh, I, 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 first of all, um, Sam, this was really wonderful. The questions you asked and the connections you made are ones, as I said, that I was not prepared to make because I didn't want the core argument to be burdened by being linked or made dependent on other arguments. And so the way in which we did that, I think, was you showed tremendous finesse, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, secondly, would be a request, as once you're happy how long this has been on your channel, if you could send the files, because I'd like this to go up on uh, the Verveki channel, because it's an ongoing part of the series, and it would be, you know, a response to 
um, the one that you did on my channel, The Voices with Raviki. Sure, absolutely. I'm 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 honored and flattered that that you view me as worthy of your airtime. I really am. So uh, I, I'd be happy to do that. Anyway, uh, John, thank you once again. This was this was really enjoyable, and uh, I look forward to where the conversation might go in the future. Thank you so much, Sam.